that, I'm now absolutely overjoyed to uh, introduce Defox Harrell. Um, he's a professor of digital media and artificial intelligence in the Comparative Media Studies Program and the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, uh, CSAIL, at MIT. Um, he's the director of the MIT Center for Advanced Virtuality, and his research explores the relationship between imagination and computation and involves inventing new forms of VR, computational narrative, video gaming for social impact, and related digital media forms. And so his entire practice is very in line with all of the things that we'll be exploring here at the festival. Um, Dr. Harrell holds a PhD in computer science and cognitive science from the University of California, San Diego, and his book, Phantasmal Media, An Approach to Imagination, Computation, and Expression, was published by the MIT uh, Press. Uh, his keynote today is called Reflections on the Avatar Dream. Uh, well, he'll reflect on how our social identities are complicated by their intersection with computing technologies, including video games, virtual worlds, social media, and related digital media forms, and how we can design experiences involving virtual identities for creative and pro-social needs. Um, so everyone out there from home, please uh, welcome, as you can, uh, Fox Harrell. Hi, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. I'm Fox Sorrell, as was mentioned. I'm Professor of Digital Media and AI at uh, MIT. And today I'll be talking with you about reflections on the avatar dream. So first, let me just introduce a little bit about uh, who I am and what I do. And so besides being a Professor of Digital Media and AI, I'm the director of the MIT Center for Advanced Virtuality. And uh, what we do is, uh, pioneer innovative experiences using technologies of virtuality. That certainly includes you know, VR, AR, MR, you know, the typical kinds of technologies we might think of as engaging virtuality, but we think uh, more broadly, that is computing systems that construct imaginative experiences atop our physical world. That could include synthetic media or uh, other forms of interactive narrative, even new forms of technology that haven't been anticipated yet. This is just to give you a sense of just uh, some of our uh, team members that range from uh, uh, immersive uh, media producers and uh, directors, uh, researchers in uh, AI and human computer interaction and uh, much more. And the key aspects of our approach are as follows. Uh, we engage in both engineering and creative practices that push the expressive potential of technologies of virtuality, simulate social and cognitive phenomena, and uh, maybe most importantly, intrinsically consider the social and cultural impacts of the work that we produce. So uh, now, you know, just at least a little bit about who I am and what I do, let me uh, provide the motivation for uh, today's talk. So to start with, there are a lot of different dreams of future technologies. This is uh, one, you know, it's the sort of dream of uh, smart everything, uh, computers in our homes in, as for our recreation, for our work and so forth. And uh, you've probably seen this in many different formulations. One could uh, call this the ubiquitous computing dream or the dream of a smart everything. Uh, another dream that I'm sure that you recognize is the AI dream. That's the dream of sentient machines the dream of uh, intelligent or conscious machines and uh, so forth. A and uh, that one also is quite uh, recognized. What I want to propose today is a different uh, dream that you probably will recognize, but maybe haven't seen it stated this way, which is that people want to use the computer to see themselves as whomever or whatever they want to be. And you can see that dream, whether it's in uh, the cyberpunk novels, say of uh, William Gibson and uh, thinking about what cyberspace looks like or a uh, uh, snow crash in which people engage in, in uh, virtual experiences using avatars, but even the very early formulations of social media, such as uh, the, uh, the well, you know, that was uh, popularized actually uh, there you know, in, on the West Coast. That was really early kind of uh, uh, social you know, on online community in which people had to use their real names to uh, communicate. 
So you would say, what does that have to do with the avatar dream? Well, if you read the early works on the well, people actually said that uh, this is wonderful because in fact, you can be whoever you want. That is, you can stage your personality and uh, so forth. You can deliberate before speaking differently than you can in an everyday conversation. I mean, now we might just call it something like uh, trolling, <laughs> but uh, yeah, actually people were using the uh, computer even at that early stage to see themselves as whomever or whatever they want to be. So I've written about this uh, from a technical point of view in uh, many different places. So uh, a while back, we had the cover story on the communications of the ACM, the largest circulating computer science magazine globally you know, that was engaging with this issue. And my point with this was not that uh, we should just promote the avatar dream, that we should blindly try to achieve it, but rather we should reimagine the avatar dream because if we don't, there are potential negative repercussions. And let me just illustrate a few of these and why I see it that way. So imagine this uh, child uh, here that is uh, engaging in uh, media in our current uh, media milieu. That means that he might have a social media profile, might create an avatar on a variety of uh, profiles, follow others, follow influencers and uh, so forth. And so like all of us, this uh, young man has a number of different types of uh, virtual selves. That is, we all have virtual identities that can be our social media profile, the online account we use to do shopping, our avatar in a virtual world or a game, and uh, even the account that we use for engaging in online uh, venues such as uh, this. Now, one of the things that uh, happens now that we know these virtual identities are pervasive, let's say this, uh, 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 that youth is engaging with a variety of uh, avatars and characters such as this one or this one and reading values into them based on how they've been constructed and is navigating that kind of virtual space in which there are all these types of avatars. These are from uh, Final Fantasy. In some ways, what this uh, youth is engaging with is actually something like uh, this. This may be familiar. This is the classic uh, Kenneth and Mamie Clark study starting from the 40s, much uh, replicated since then, crucial in Brown versus Board of Education in which African-American school children were asked questions like, which doll is the good doll? Which is the nice doll? And even which doll is like you? You see which uh, the doll, these dolls were painted, these were ad identical dolls, but were dolls that were painted uh, differently to suggest the difference of uh, ethnicity. And you can see which doll the youth uh, uh, tended to uh, choose. Uh, that is the doll that was identified typically as the white doll. I should say some of these kids even eventually burst into tears when they're asked later after which is good, which is nice and so forth, which one is like you. The idea is that uh, those values are pervasive in society. Even people within a group you know, will still have those same kind of values. I call phantasms, these kind of uh, uh, insidious social uh, ideas that are built into our motor sensory engagement with the world. The point uh, here for today is that virtual identities impact our performance, our engagement, our senses of self and our perspectives of others. And more than that, since biases can be embedded in virtual identity technologies, it's imperative to consider their social impacts. So let me just provide a little bit about, uh, by way of a definition here. So some people will say uh, uh, virtual versus uh, real, but sometimes I will begin to ask questions such as uh, if someone is uh, uh, harassed online uh, or bullied online, even to the point of uh, violence or self-harm, would you want to say, well, that wasn't a real experience. You know, that was just a virtual experience. Or if someone engages in transformative learning, you don't want to say that that isn't real, that it doesn't translate into their real life. So I'd rather distinguish between physical world and a virtual and say that physical world identity uh, experiences are those that are informed by history, culture, and values in this physical world that often manifest as the behaviors and actions. Then we can say that virtual identities are something much more restrictive. These are computational selves or data structures that are used in construction of the actual virtual representation, these characters, avatars, accounts, and so forth. 
as well as the algorithms that implement their functionality. And so, in fact, what we're often talking about building on the work of scholars like uh, Jim G, who talks about projective identity, or scholars in cognitive science that talk about blending of uh, concepts to produce new ones, we could actually say that we're usually talking about a blended identity. That is, we're projecting whether it's our values or our control or other aspects of our physical world self onto the virtual identity. And that's really where the action is. That's where a lot of the stakes are, where we care about this identity because we put some of ourselves into that identity as we're using it. So some of the kind of research that I do at uh, MIT is to innovate uh, and uh, design new forms of virtual identity for interactive narratives, video games, social media, and uh, VR. Not all of our work deals with uh, identity, but just uh, for today, I think in this particular moment, you know, that is in the face of the global reckoning that we're all going through uh, with the pandemic, but also the social reckonings around issues such as uh, police violence and racial violence and uh, all of the kind of uh, the issues, misinformation and much uh, more than uh, I thought that for today, now that we're all virtual in some sense, I would focus on this issue of identity. Just to give you a sense of the scope of the issue, because some of you might say, well, I see some of these kind of uh, points, but uh, still only some people play uh, video games and so forth, and uh, notwithstanding the fact that these identities are pervasive. So I like just to show this uh, stat, it's a few years old, but telling nonetheless. You know, so this is the global revenue of video games. And what you see on the right here in uh, green is in fact the global revenue of the film industry in terms of billions of uh, dollars which is about equal to uh, just that of handheld and uh, mobile games. So it's a narrow lens, but an important one nonetheless, just to say that this is an influential medium. In terms of uh, social media, in, in, well, in terms of use of these kind of games, you can see you know, that these are you know, from, told from various uh, studies that actually it's quite diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, who uses these games. This is from a US study. The categories just, uh, I think are called from that study. Uh, it's not uh, you know, my uh, terms uh, here, but I think it's important just to note the percentages and also for uh, gender, it's not 50-50 or exactly uh, even, but sometimes there's a stereotype around uh, gender and gaming that actually isn't held up when you look at the actual demographics. That, uh, that play. Same with social media use. This is uh, from Pew Foundation. Again, just showing the wide uptake you know, in terms of uh, gender diversity and in terms of uh, race and ethnicity uh, diversity. Now, when you look at the games themselves, then we have a different story. So this was a study of uh, the top 150 uh, 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 video games, you know, this was from about 10 years ago, but uh, the story is much uh, similar now. Uh, and what you see the, you know, that in contrast to the 56% of players being male, 86% of characters being male, and similarly for race and uh, ethnicity, we have skewed percentages from the, the people that actually use this uh, medium. What's important to notice uh, here too, is that when you take out sports games, the racial disparities become even more jarring. You can go deeper and then begin to look at not just percentages in terms of representation, but also how these representations are deployed. So for instance, 90% of black females, 45% of white females being depicted as props or victims of uh, violence. So this is another study that was uh, cited by uh, uh, Craig Watkins and Anne Everett. Going even further, the scope of sexism online, you know, that is 73% of women have faced cyber online attacks. Women are 27 times more likely to be victimized on the internet than men. And that's times not percent more likely. I mean, this issue has even been brought up at the uh, United Nations. So what can we do in the, you know, in the face of this? One of the sort of things that I've been interested in doing is using computational techniques, some statistical techniques, some AI techniques to reveal some of the way that these biases are built into these kind of systems. So I'll talk to you today. I'll give one example of our work 
analyzing virtual identity systems. And then just a few examples of our, our work since we have a fair amount of time of our work designing systems to do differently and uh, get people to think uh, and engage with these kind of uh, topics uh, through say narrative and other forms of engagement. So to begin with analyzing these kind of systems, I will analyze, I'll show you our analysis of a very popular uh, game. You know, so Outer Scrolls for Oblivion, uh, I mean, won a, a, a best-selling game. The sequel to this game, uh, Skyrim, you know, I've noted in some talks, this is one that uh, made about nine times the revenue. You know, so on its first day of release, made about nine times the revenue of Star Wars on its best weekend. That's adjusted for inflation. So it's, you know, that's again, one lens just for the impact of the Elder Scrolls series. And actually the series does quite a lot well when it comes to uh, representation uh, within it. There's quite a diversity there. And so the issues that I'll bring up aren't just uh, representative of say some lapse by uh, the company that produced this. Actually, I think there are a number of exemplary aspects of that particular game, but rather you can look at it as an exemplar of a phenomenon that's more uh, pervasive within the society more broadly. So to begin with in the game, for those who aren't uh, familiar, you have, a, it's a role-playing game, a computational role-playing game, fantasy setting. So you could imagine Dungeons and Dragons type uh, game, you know, but uh, set with, uh, uh, but of course it, it's uh, uh, their, uh, their own particular kind of uh, uh, world that's been created. You have a, lot, a wide latitude in terms of customizing the character. So you see here, these are the sliders just for cheeks of your character. <laughs> so if you imagine full you know, body and face and, uh, so, and facial structure and so forth, there's just a, a huge number of possibilities for how you, how you customize your character. So you have a human types, non-human types, also your stats. Uh, as well, your, your numerical stats that judge how you, well, you accomplish activities within the game, your dexterity, speed, intelligence, and so forth, are also customizable. So this is just uh, taking from uh, a chart of the default stats according to race and uh, gender within the game. And so right off the bat, we notice some interesting uh, phenomena. So for instance, if you have a female avatar of certain kind of uh, races, uh, called Argonians and Orcs uh, here, then you're going to happen to be 10 points more intelligent by default than your uh, male counterpart. Uh, so that's interesting, a uh, gender dimorphism within the game. But even more than that, when we're not looking at non-human types like those races, here we might contrast, say, the Red Guard, which are the ostensibly African characters within the game, to the Bretons, which are the ostensibly French characters within the game. And uh, you can see here that, uh, in fact, the default intelligence of the uh, Red Guard is 30, it's 20, it's 30, where it's 50 for the Breton, 20 points less intelligent, regardless of gender, than the uh, uh, Breton or French uh, counterpart. Similarly for uh, Nords, it's a kind of stereotypical uh, Viking uh, uh, representation. So, but I wanted to go further. I mean, this is interesting just to begin with because it's a different critique than the well-known and important ones of say body image of Laura Croft and other types of characters according to gender, very important types of critique. But here I'm interested in the infrastructure, the data structural infrastructure of the uh, technology. So I asked, can we go further? And so working with one of my students, uh, Chung Yu uh, Lim, who's now since earned his uh, PhD, we began to look at how we can use computational techniques to reveal these kind of biases. And it's interesting because there's so much discussion around algorithmic bias these days, how AI systems can embed bias. I think uh, one crucial aspect of our work here is using these technologies instead to reveal bias. So I'm not going to get into all the details of our technique. You know, so I'll describe you know, one kind of technique related to a clustering. We do other robust, uh, more AI or machine learning, machine learning techniques, such as uh, particular deep learning techniques to look at novelty of avatars across different countries and so forth. But today I'll focus on a kind of approach that is related to clustering called archetypal analysis. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, Clustering is an approach in data science to so look at uh, 
groups of uh, uh, items in a data set and finding similarities between them. So you might have a number of points that are plotted and here we found three different clusters that are noted according to a uh, by color. Archetypal analysis is an approach that works a bit uh, differently. So rather than just finding uh, groups of individuals, rather it tries to find uh, extreme types that can compute what's called a convex hull around your data set. So what that means is just uh, you find a few types that can be used to describe you know, archetypes there. So it's been used in sports analysis, for instance. So imagine in the NBA, you might uh, try to characterize some set of uh, players and you might have uh, one archetype, which is very good at everything. You know, that might be someone like, uh, like LeBron James, for instance. You might have another one that's just good at, uh, you know, that's especially good at defense, you know, like uh, Dennis Rodman back in the day was just known for his defense, not offense. And you might have another archetype that is defined in terms of uh, you know, just the, uh, you know, that, that's maybe a uh, bench warmer, you know, that's kind of marginally in the, in the league, good compared to probably the rest of us, you know, but compared to other NBA players, not as strong. Then you could describe any other player as a combination of those archetypes. So you might say player X is 90% LeBron James and 10% to Dennis Rodman, for instance. So it's a very intuitive way to characterize your data set in terms of archetypes. To give another example, let's say we're classifying uh, birds. One might be, you know, and again, you're trying to find the extreme types. So a bird that talks, for example, not just your everyday, uh, say, uh, robin or something like this would be an extreme type. A bird that swims would be another kind of extreme type. And a bird that's really angry, <laughs> that might be another kind of extreme type. So then you might say one like this, which is uh, actually the penguin from, uh, from the Batman movie, which both is a bird that swims, it talks and it's really angry, is exactly one third of each of these archetypes. So that's just to give you an intuitive understanding. So what we did in our case was run the default data according to race and uh, gender from Elder Scrolls and use that uh, data to uh, find a certain set of archetypes. In our case, these archetypes ended up to be uh, the ones that you might expect, but this wasn't our description, this came from the data. So one was uh, stealth thief oriented, one was strength oriented, one was intelligence oriented. And so when you plot out the default uh, characters in terms of uh, race and gender, a few interesting phenomena preserved. So this is called a ternary plot diagram. And so it's just showing how close each one of these points are to the archetypes. So for instance, you might notice that the uh, Nord male only has characteristics. It's only optimized to play as a fighter, strength oriented with no characteristics of the intelligence oriented type. Uh, similarly for the uh, red guard uh, male. Female are, characters are never considered primary, you know, they're never, solely considered examples of one particular archetype, and they're only optimized to play as the thief within the, within the game. The red guard male is only optimized, as I mentioned, to be in the strength archetype with no characteristics of the intelligence or wisdom oriented archetype. Now in the game, you can change your stats through a gameplay, but many players are what are called uh, min-max players or kind of power players that don't, you know, that choose their race based on the maximal eventuality of those characters. And so they would never choose a character that isn't optimized to play as a certain kind of uh, class. So what you can say, and this image is actually from apartheid South Africa, is that within a number of systems that we use, in fact, there is system embedded bias that we have to be aware of and try to do something about. And it's been shown in our research and other research that virtual identities change our performance, our engagement in the physical world, our behaviors in the physical world. So it's actually a crucial issue. The impacts don't just stay in that virtual environment. So the impacts of this kind of work, analyzing systems for real bias are uh, multiple. Systems can serve a larger, broader set of users. Designers have techniques to ensure equity of their systems. Policymakers have uh, quantitative empirical evidence to support assessments, ratings, and uh, so forth. 
So now let me move on to our work in uh, designing uh, virtual identity systems. So we designed a large number of the, you know, a, a fair number of these kind of systems, ones that look at issues like racial microaggressions, this one through the lens of metaphor, sea creatures standing in for microaggressions. This is the alien in one's own land microaggression. Sorry, we don't get many octopuses around here, the seahorse says to the octopus. Issues of uh, gatekeeping and glass ceilings and passing and so forth. Musical identities, uh, that is the ways that our, our identities are conveyed through our musical preferences, tastes and so forth. And so I'll just talk about uh, uh, just a small number of these uh, before, uh, before concluding. So one is our work on virtual identities against biases of sexism. So we built a system which is called, uh, called uh, uh, Grayscale. Actually, it's using an architecture you know, that actually is no longer patent pending. It's uh, pat patented for representing identities in a more nuanced, uh, a more nuanced way computationally. This system creates a model that's called ambivalent sexism. And uh, that you know, means that it's used, it's an interactive narrative that shows not only hostile sexism that's been importantly reported on you know, through Me Too and so forth, that's been catalyzed in the media. Actually, we started this work quite ahead of that because like some of these issues around uh, uh, police violence, it's not something that is uh, new. It's something that has just been attenu uh, 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 att attenuated within the media just now. So it's a system that's called a uh, grayscale. You play as an HR executive who has to field a lot of issues in your company that, that have to do with sexism. So I'll just give a few examples. I mean, it's uh, online, but you would, you know, it looks like a streamlined kind of uh, narrative. It's actually called an epistolary uh, narrative. These are narratives told through a series of uh, journal entries or letters, it's in that tradition. Actually, Dracula is in that tradition as a series of journal entries. In this case, uh, one example here, that is, uh, let's say someone uh, has written to the company uh, 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 list, something like this. Our company has a dress code for a reason. Yoga pants are A, unprofessional, and B, distracting. This is an office, not a gym. Please show some respect for your coworkers and for yourself. So, you might have some choices about what to uh, do here. So for instance, you might say, it's not your responsibility to police your coworkers' clothing. And uh, so you should contact uh, HR, you know, not a group, uh, send out a group email. But someone might also say, for instance, actually it's comments about coworkers' attire being quote unquote distracting that are inappropriate. Right, so actually there are a number of kind of possi possibilities as you play through the system. And what it does is categorize you in terms of how you're supporting or displaying issues such as complementary gender differentiation, paternalistic attitudes, inappropriate intimacy, and so on within that space. And you could play it uh, online. I mean, it actually has a soundtrack and you know, it's, you know, there are ways that bring you into the narrative and you get to know more about the characters and actually there are different uh, outcomes each time. So it's being modeled, you know, might be, for instance, as you go, you're showing more and more of a paternalistic attitude. And there are, you know, this is just showing that there are a lot of different kind of eventualities, just a chart of, uh, of possible uh, outcomes. And so you might have an outcome, for instance, such as uh, Grayscale has concluded that morale at your branch might have been better if you had intervened more in your role as a H, uh, as an HR manager, do something quickly or there'll be uh, consequences, that's a negative outcome. If you're a hostile sexist, or even if it's a positive outcome, you know, because you've been uh, you know, non-sexist or anti-sexist, you might get a response such as, it's interesting, your management strategy is working for now, but if productivity doesn't improve, then we're going to go back to the old way of doing things. You know, so also just showing some of the institutional issues around this kind of topic. And the aim in this kind of work, some people say, like, is this all about VR and empathy and so forth? Actually, or is it to let someone walk in another's shoes? Actually, I don't think about it that way. Rather, I think about it like this. If you have a youth say that you want to, you know, to have, learn about the insect life cycle and they play a game about uh, butterflies or something like this, the aim is not so that they will go come away saying, wow, now I really know what it's like to be a butterfly. Rather, you want them to see the systematicity, that is when they see 
bees or ants or any other kind of insect, they understand that cycle from uh, uh, egg, larva, pupa, adult, and so forth, and can name and place that wherever they see it. Right, yeah, so this, uh, yeah, that's similar with our work. We actually want them to see the systematicity of ambivalent sexism when they engage with this. So just to show uh, uh, another uh, example, this is a piece about uh, biases against uh, war that is by uh, my good friend and collaborator and also one of our board members, Kareem Bana Khalifa. This is a work that is called uh, The Enemy and you see you know, the producers of, of this on the uh, slide. And so uh, my role on this uh, working with Kareem was as human computer inter uh, interaction producer the system aims to show combatants from uh, different wars you know, or different conflicts such as in, in East Congo, gangs of El Salvador uh, or uh, uh, in uh, Gaza and ask same basic uh, questions, which is one of Kareem's innovations. That is, why do you fight? Have you killed before? What's peace for you? What's war for you? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? and through the differences and convergences between the answers actually humanize the other in the state of war because dehumanization, he says, is one of the necessary conditions for perpetuating war. So it's been written about in a number of different kinds of places, very well, uh, well uh, received, but more important than that is I think the aims and the impact. So this gives you a sense of the space. One of the aspects I worked with Kareem on was a model that, that would read the body language of attendees because it's in a very large space, 15 people at any given time. And through your body language as a proxy for your nervousness and bias, it changes the way the conflict is uh, staged. There's also an AR version that uh, they produced uh, uh, as well. And it gives additional uh, stats on this uh, uh, about uh, the conflict and uh, more. So I wanna just give you a sense of what it looks like just through a brief excerpt of one of the uh, uh, trailers that uh, the co-producers have uh, shared. The project is rooted in my experience as a war photographer, going from one side of the front line to the other and finding that the fighters' dreams, hopes, and nightmares are often more similar than they are different. So there is a bigger story than the war itself. And this is the one I want to explore and share. For the enemy, I am using the latest technologies in virtual and augmented realities, so you can engage directly with the combatants and meet them, hear them, and feel them the way I did. In many parts of our world, you create an enemy as a kid without having met your enemy, because the society around you has created an enemy in the other. So the question is, could I be you if I was on the other side? Right, and I should mention that if you're interested, actually at the New Images Festival in uh, France, uh, Kareem is uh, speaking uh, just even, uh, uh, I believe, uh, tomorrow. Yeah, so. Uh, you can uh, take a look at the next project. So virtual identity, and next I'll just talk about virtual identities against biases of uh, culture. So one of the works we did in this area was called uh, the, revolution, you know, the Revolution of a Hip Hop Breakbeat Narrative Experience. And so this is a system called Breakbeat Narratives that's personalized by categorizing users based on their musical uh, preferences and provides a customized narrative and playlist. So it's quite different work this is for a museum, it's, well, I think so uh, as well. This is one of the characters that we created for, you know, for this who are called uh, the Elementals. Yeah, this is in collaboration with, uh, uh, between uh, you know, yeah, the artwork you know, is collaboration between myself and Black Kirby. That's the name of the artist, John Jennings and Stacy Robinson's both also professors. Yeah. So the Elementals are actually named like uh, the characters you might find in Marvel comics and so forth, like the uh, uh, Celestials or the Watchers, but in this case, they're named after the elements of hip hop. That is uh, MC, uh, DJ, uh, there's uh, graffiti art, breakdance, and knowledge, which is sometimes overlooked as an element of hip hop, knowledge of self, knowledge of culture, knowledge of history. 
And so what our system does, it was a flagship exhibition. It's actually now just opening back uh, up after COVID restrictions. Now this is at, at the, the museum will open just in a few years in the Bronx. They have a perpetual space up until then and continuing that it shows this work. Ours was a flagship. You walk into the space. This is the first thing that you that you see there. This is giving you just a broader sense of the space. You know, there are a lot of artifacts, archival material, and uh, so forth. Yeah, and this is these are all just images of that uh, museum space right now. So this is now zooming in on that large scale kiosk system. You interact with the elementals. So as a collaboration with uh, Microsoft, conversation through their conversation of AI a group called uh, uh, Toons Map and their Educational Foundation and the Hip Hop Museum. We produced this uh, system that uh, will first get a sense of your musical preferences. Then, uh, so it'll ask you questions about your genre preferences, which hip hop lyrics you prefer between multiple ones and so on. And so for instance, if you come in and you're someone that listens only to uh, campestral music like country, Western and bluegrass, and you're interested in the role of women in hip hop, you will get a narrative that has a soundtrack that has a hip hop music that has soundtrack and themes of that type of rural music and say a narrative that's about the self-representation of women in hip hop. So just to give you a sense of what that looks like when you go to the kiosk, you can see here. As you interact with uh, with these uh, uh, characters, then you begin to uh, uh, make your choices. You get choices of different lyrics, like here it's uh, contrasting between the lyrics of uh, you know, Jay-Z and uh, Tupac you know, and uh, so forth. Right. After checking out those lyrics, you will get your customized carousel style of narrative. You can proceed to navigate that at your leisure. And even at the very end of the experience, you can take home with you your customized uh, mixtape. You know, that is based on your preference. You get a QR code that gives you a mixtape. You can go off to uh, Spotify and listen to those songs further at your uh, leisure. So the idea there is to uh, use uh, go against the kind of biases about what exists within uh, museums and how we might access the information. And just to conclude, one final example is virtual identities against biases of misinformation, crucial for our political moment. So one project uh, produced in uh, uh, Center for Advanced Virtuality, shown in many different locations, con uh, a selection of Cannes Film Festival, Tribeca, and uh, award winner at IDFA, and uh, more is in event of a moon disaster. So this was co-directed by Francesca Panetta, who is an XR creative director in the center that I run, and uh, Halsey uh, uh, Bergend, uh, who is a, a fellow at uh, uh, MIT in the Open Doc Lab. It's just produced by the Center for Advanced uh, Virtuality, and we have a number of uh, supporters. Uh, and uh, this is a project that uh, addresses the issue of uh, deep fakes. So, if you're not familiar with deep fakes, just to give you a sense of what they are, you can see uh, here. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Right, yeah, so this, it's apparently uh, uh, Barack Obama, you know, but actually you can see through the video that in fact this was Jordan Peele in puppeteering a kind of a Barack Obama and uh, using his own uh, comedic skills to do the voice. We're what this work uh, did was recreate the speech, you know, this coming from our center in the moon disaster that Richard Nixon would have given if the moon landing had been unsuccessful. It was written by Bill Sapphire. Actually, it's a beautiful elegaic speech. It begins, uh, I mean, if gendered for, the, you know, for, you know, for that uh, time period, but it begins, fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon uh, to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. And so the aim of, of this work was to create a deep fake work that is aimed not to fool the public, but to help educate the public around the deep fakes. So there was, at the original exhibition in IDFA, a 60s style living room and a lot of ancillary materials such as newspapers with articles that actually explain how deep fakes are made. What are the kind of issues around them? What are the challenges? 
and so forth. And there actually is a website you can go and look. You know, there's a Scientific American made a documentary about this kind of issue, and uh, and focused on our project. So you can take a look online and actually engage your ability to discern uh, deep fakes uh, through through that. To give to give you a sense of just the process, this is an example first of just creating the uh, uh, voice from this. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. So that's clearly not Nixon's uh, voice. That's an actor performing. So the, uh, the generative adversarial network that's using, actually you know, we need a lot of uh, data you know, and uh, both of uh, Nixon, but as well data of uh, actor giving the uh, speech. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Now this here, you can just hear the synthesized voice of Nixon. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men. So you can see that the first one was an example of synthesizing the visual elements with the actor's voice. Here, the voice has been uh, synthesized. Sometimes you use the term synthetic media more broadly than deep fake, which has a negative uh, connotation. Synthetic media is where you have po also po possibly positive applications, I think, such as ours. And then those are actually combined. So you could say that this is a kind of a complete deep fake in the sense that it's both the audio and the uh, visual. Ignition. So I want to just uh, share just a brief uh, trailer to whet your interest, and then you can maybe go look online for an event of moon disaster, and you can actually engage with the uh, website you know, that we've produced around this uh, work. Ignition sequence starts. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. The 12 alarm. 12 alarm. Alarm. Well, maybe the problem here. And We're going to alarm. Alarm. We go. Flight side, we've lost mission. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. Good night. All right, so again, in this case, it's virtual identity or synthesized identity being used to address the kind of issues of misinformation that are crucial for this uh, moment. Ignition. So you might remember back at the very beginning of this talk, I said virtual identities are important because they impact uh, our performance in everyday life, our engagement, our senses of self, and our perspectives of others. And since biases can be embedded in virtual identity technologies, it's imperative to consider their social impacts. And I think I've demonstrated a few cases where we have considered the social impacts and designed them to address this. Further, the avatar dream, whether it's uh, deep fakes or your taste in music or addressing issues of uh, conflict or sexism and more, we are trying to reimagine this, not just as where people use the computer to see themselves as whomever or whatever they want to be, but as a space where people use the computer to look at the issues and the kind of oppression, biases and so forth in a more holistic way to allow people to be whoever they want to without the yoke of those kind of oppressive forces. So just to conclude in terms of reimagining the avatar dream, I suggest let's reimagine this avatar dream as an empowering vision in which consideration of its social impacts is intrinsic to the act of inventing it. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thanks, Fox. That was my pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a couple of questions, I guess. I mean, I really uh, loved how you so eloquently made the point of how these technologies are, how they enact various sorts of um, biases and and they embody certain sorts of cultural um tropes in when we make them and i think the same is true of art um i i guess my one of my questions is um or 
how we get these space be, beyond creating spaces that um, try and present more equitable, inclusive uh, ideas within the way they're built. Um, the way everything is so polarized right now, what we end up having is people don't come to these spaces uh, wanting to learn really, or like grow or develop. You know, I know some I know some really good people um, who are great people and then they go online and then they enact their worst impulses um, and are worst people online. And so do you and I didn't feel like this was direct. Your talk was about a little bit of a different thing, but I wanted to ask if you had any uh, experience or data to support the fact that when you build environments that uh, embody better ways of being that when people walk into them, they also, it, it, it does have this sort of transformative um, reflection that you talked about in here. Right, thanks, it's, it's a great question. So I, I think one part of it is starting with, are there some people that might be resistant in some ways to engaging in these kind of experiences and then what's the evidence that these kind of experiences can spark reflection and there's a great point that you used that a uh, phrase reflection and how they might lead to change in terms of behavior or a concept you know, so one yes we have done studies you know so for instance i can give a couple of examples the work uh, um, uh, of grayscale that i mentioned we actually showed that when people engage with the experience, they actually do reflect and engage in perspective transformation. So we started with a number of uh, pilot studies in this area, then did another large scale study and found that people actually did enter into stages of perspective trans transformation. And I think a key thing is that role play can be wonderful for engaging in reflection, because unlike in the physical world, uh, the linguist Jim G uses this uh, phrase, uh, uh, it creates a psychosocial moratorium. What that means is just a space where you can explore without the negative potential consequences or risks of the physical world. So people can try out these kind of behaviors within that uh, space and then uh, actually begin to reflect on them. And reflection then is shown as one of the key building blocks for conceptual change. One of the other projects that we did, and this one had uh, an aggregate of over uh, 10,000 uh, users in our studies, was a project for uh, public school students you know, to engage, uh, uh, you know, basically to broaden participation in computer science using virtual identities. And so we built a computer science learning game, not just a game, a platform you know, called MazeStar. And so they can play the game. Playing the game gives you some key concepts around programming, like block structures, conditionals, and so forth. But they can actually recreate their, you know, they can create their own games and do, you know, create new skins and so forth, engage in basic principles of human computer interaction and so forth, and it's aligned with the national curriculum. And more than that, the aim was to look at how avatars could shape students' perspectives of selves as powerful learners and doers of computer science. And so these are students for, underrepresented within computer science from diverse or racial ethnic groups and uh, and. Uh, uh, girls within the public schools and use these virtual identities as proxies. And we showed that in many conditions, we can mitigate against stereotype threat, you know, the issues where people just perform up or down to expectations of themselves. We found conditions like successful likeness. If it looks like you when you're doing well, and you maybe just give a little feedback when not, you can build up a positive association with yourself. And so we're able to show that we're able to enhance both the performance as well as engagement, their emotional connection with the material using these virtual identities. So that's just a, that case uh, evidence over uh, 10,000 uh, users and studies, uh, as well as our prior uh, our prior work. Oh, great, thanks. Um, another slightly different question, I guess, about uh, accessibility of the technology. Um, I don't particularly care for the word democratization, but it's used a lot to get to what I'm getting at um which is there's clearly and this is true with a, you know any sort of art using um more advanced technologies is there's a social economic barrier barrier to 
as a creator to get access to this thing. Um, and I, particularly, um, I like to compare this stuff to the internet quite a bit because we, with the internet, we started with this open web that was sort of utopian and had a lot of access to creators and then it moved towards a space where things were kind of um, got balkanized into platforms that made everyone content creators and not um, in a very narrow sense, but not really able to to uh, use the web. And, and with these virtual like VR sorts of technologies, we're kind of already starting from the other direction a little bit. And you have, you know, like Mozilla Hubs platforms and things that are starting to try and make some things that are more open. Um, but I just wonder if you have any thoughts around how we can, for, for these sorts of virtual worlds, um, besides making sure that we financially support uh, a diverse set of creators um, on the technology and kind of make sure that everyone has access to be able to explore this enactment? Right, that's another great question. And I could begin one with just uh, even from the media consumer as well as producer point of view that segues with your last question, which is just a necessity one that these kind of experiences they don't have they shouldn't just only be embedded in say learning experiences you know like experiences that are you know like meant to be like didactic or heavy handed or workplace training but rather mm -hmm. could be integrated into other popular forms so for instance grand theft auto is often maligned for some of the kind of issues around gender representation violence and so forth it actually does have some amount of, of a social critique, especially built into the satirical radio shows. But then after you hear that critique, then you have to go out and kill people to progress in your missions and so forth. Otherwise it doesn't uh, go on narratively. Uh, but imagine for instance, it, rather than a didactic training tool around racial profiling, if it was just built into the world that makes it both more plausible, realistic and so forth, and people begin to see the systematicity of that kind of uh, experience. So that's just uh, one you know, part here. We do think about except, you know, in terms of access, you know, we've done some work with my PhD student, Danielle Olson, just now thinking about racial and ethnic socialization using VR. And that's uh, working with a group, uh, Rihanna Elisa Anderson at the University of uh, Michigan, who have a program to help students think through how they've been socialized around race, also for teacher training. And the issue here is it's not what you look like in the VR space, like what often because too many experiences, it's just uh, the body type of your avatar to determine gender, the skin color is a proxy for uh, race, it's nothing about actual experience. So in this case, what we're modeling is the same exact scenario will appear differently based on how you've been socialized. So for instance, a schoolgirl, African American schoolgirl who has been accused of cheating when we know that she hasn't cheated by a teacher and you have to and there's you know, and we know that according to the game and people will read that same scenario very differently if she says uh, mrs smith i don't know why you thought that i cheated here or something like this yeah you know, some people if they're socialized in one way you know that is let's say colorblind <clears throat> and so forth might say something like i don't know why the student had to make it about race even if in the game she doesn't actually say anything about uh, race they're only yeah. seeing the avatar other kinds of socialization include preparation for bias you know, or uh, having uh, uh, some pride in you know, kind of like cultural history of, of diverse groups and so forth or the negative one is a mistrust of other groups you know so what we're actually measuring is how people are socialized and then changing the experience based on how they've been socialized to see this and then using that to perform some kind of a intervention uh, with uh, you know, with the kind of anti-bias uh, experiences. And in that case, we actually use just uh, uh, social VR to make it accessible. You know, it looks just like the old Viewmaster toy, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, that, you know, that kind of system. You could even just use Google Cardboard, you know, for instance, with uh, Android. And so that's one way to make it accessible. Also, mm -hmm. we're not only doing work in headsets. So the work yeah. like Grayscale, that's browser-based, you know, like, uh, the work uh, in event of moon disaster that's also accessible through browser, even though it's a deep fake and also festival quality through VR and installation. So we have a lot of different uh, uh, formulations of our work, even taking into classrooms, as I mentioned, just to make it uh, accessible. Cool. That might be a nice segue actually into a question from the audience, if we can do one real quick. Um, sure. Trevor Flowers asks, as we move from presenting ourselves on a flat screen to inhabiting bodies with voices in XR, 
how does that change our ability to present radically different selves? Sure, it's, it's a great question. So in some sense, it's a question about uh, presence. Actually, the class I'm co-teaching just now is on a uh, uh, virtuality and uh, presence. And so, I mean, I think it has to do, I see another question too, has to deal with issues of, uh, uh, of uh, embodiment. And so for me, you know, like a part, a part of a kind of issue in 3D, spa 3D spaces, or what are the affordances of the uh, medium? Because there's been a lot of hype around issues like uh, VR for empathy and so forth. When you begin to look at the neuroscience and empathy, actually you might find some, you know, like a handful of different types of empathy in the same uh, article that are being described. Often empathy is understood as a trait, like introversion or extroversion, not just as uh, what's called situational empathy that can actually be uh, modulated uh, easily. So when you have, you know, so one of my master's students had an idea in her thesis that's called staged empathy. And so staged empathy isn't to suggest that it's a uh, fake, but rather this idea that like film or other media, it's not just gonna be a fallout of putting some, a camera in front of something and letting the film roll that it's going to impact people. You actually have to know the conventions of film and use them in, in, a, in an effective way. And, and in the case of VR, a couple of issues that the student Ainsley Sutherland mentioned are intentional looking and direct address. Intentional looking means that unlike when you're looking at the flat screen, the way that you're looking actually impacts the experience that you're having. So as you're looking at, at someone in one way or another, or you're seeming nervous or biased and those sort of things, that embodied feedback can actually be taken into account during the experience. And then of course, direct manipulation in contrast to uh, 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 other types of experience or, or direct address that is a system speaking directly towards you. So based on how you interact, it's not to the audience at large, like in our system, uh, uh, Passage Home VR that Danielle Olson worked on, it's saying that you have been socialized in this way to, in terms of race and ethnicity. So that's also different than other media and can come from that experience. So that, that's just a couple of uh, ways that I think that some of our virtual experiments afford new possibilities, but I don't think it's something like one medium is way better than another. It's rather, how can we best use the affordances of that particular medium for the purpose at hand? Mm -hmm. um, anything else down here? No. Um, one more question, just because it's been on my mind, is um, what do you think is holding up public adoption of VR and XR? Because if I ever thought there was a moment <laughs> that um, maybe like the headsets are cheap enough, people are locked in their houses for six months. I don't know what the stats and figures are in the video game world. Maybe there's been widespread adoption, I'm not sure, but certainly in the public at large, there hasn't been, and there doesn't seem to be the appetite for it. I mean, do we have a, like a supply side problem here? Or like, what's it like, where's the demand for this and how do we, you know, any thoughts on that? Or is it just not cheap enough and, you know, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. And also, I did want to circle back to one thing, uh, to just yeah, what please. you mentioned about uh, the kind of access issue, because uh, there's, I think, a really strong thesis by another master's student named Maya Wagoner, where she suggested, in addition to the kind of typical outreach around access, uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of idea, instead of uh, critical community technologies. So this is where people in particular communities are gaining the literacy such as uh, the literacies around uh, uh, reading data so that you can have, let's say, uh, you know, there's one, one uh, uh, project you know, that, this is a university project, but the million dollar blocks project that looks at the amount of money that was spent in incarceration in a certain area and then mapping that out so you can see how much money was spent there instead of education or other topics. If, and there's other work like mapping police violence project and so forth. Mm -hmm. So if people get access to the kind of skills and it's community driven and uh, so forth, that's not kind of like techno, you know, she talks about it as techno solutionist and uh, you know, really individually oriented and uh, like a, a sometimes I say deficit model, let's just help the people rather than seeing people as having a lot, of inner, you know, a lot of power in themselves and their communities. I just wanted to mention that's another kind of approach, you know, really grassroots community kind of engagement with these kind of, you know, with, with some of those kind of uh, aims. In terms of adoption, yeah, I mean, I've been interested in this area for a long time. I'm one of these kind of people that 
was always interested in the same thing. So like as an undergrad, senior honors thesis was on a uh, new forms of interactive narrative, masters, same thing, PhD computational narrative. And so, you know, I remember back in the nineties, it was a prior point in this, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, uh, cycle of, uh, you know, of enthusiasm around, uh, uh, around uh, VR. Uh -huh. At that point, we didn't have uh, widespread uh, broadband and we didn't have the same processor power that we do now and so in some sense, you know, it, it's a, a lot more accessible and possible then, but there are also just some kind of uh, just social barriers too, such as the fact that uh, say VR in con contrast to AR can be used to contrast, you know, to create fan for fantastic world building, but of course it blocks the world. So you have to think about your physical world environment. You have to mm -hmm. think about how you're performing. That is imagine playing a dance dance revolution in a VR space and people are looking at you, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of experience, you know, this, you know, and uh, so I think that there are just some particular kind of cases where it will be taken up. And then of course, other kind of issues with uh, AR. So I think it's, you know, another way to look at it is, uh, you know, like um, at one point, people imagined hypertext fiction will be the next form of the novel. You know, like yeah. every novel will be interactive. You can click through and so forth. And so you could say, do we really read a lot of hypertext fiction? People read some nowadays, but it's not the main version. But when you think, do people read hypertext text, <laughs> like in news and other sort of things, we all read hypertext. You know, when you go to any website, you're reading hypertext and clicking through links and so forth. So you and might think about fiction. Right, yeah, <laughs> that, that's that's pretty true. <laughs> yeah, so you could you could look at it that way, you know, that XR in some sense it might be pervasive, but not in the ways that we imagine. Not what might not only be in the way you imagine, say, through the holodeck, but in a number of different kind of eventualities in, in which uh, fiction uh, fictional engagement might just be one. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. I think we might want to break it back out into some lounge conversation now, yeah? Yeah, great. And so um, we're going to jump into the lounge to continue the conversation. The lounge is a fluid space, so feel free to explore new connections. It's just like entering a room full of people. You'll see a number of conversations, and you can join or listen in. Um, for the nerds in the audience, you can use a virtual cam if you want to send video into the lounge instead of your own face. So we encourage you to experiment, be virtual, play around, share links to your work also. Um, so I'm going to hop over there and you can join me, say hi, just listen in. Um, please meet someone new and share your takeaways from the keynote. So thank you once again. Yeah. Fox, Fox, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it thanks. A great, way, great way to start the festival. Uh, my pleasure. I'm so glad. Thanks a lot. And I'm logging off. Okay. Have a great rest of the festival. Too. Okay. Bye. Bye.